Welcome to Living Surrey, which this week is from Red Hill Aerodrome, which we're going to show you is the hub for all things aviation in Surrey. This is Charlie Delta, Charlie 1, ready for departure. Line of 3-6, that was Coming up in tonight's show, we take a look at the last ever Spartan Arrow. Saving lives by getting to emergencies as fast as possible, the Kent, Surrey and Sussex Air Ambulance leads the way. We talk to Dr Richard Lyon. Plus, a busy day in the life of Red Hill Aerodrome, from cake to air traffic control. And, come fly with me, it's really more accessible than you might think. We're starting tonight by meeting a venerable old lady. This is the last Spartan Arrow in the world, and in the year of her manufacture, Al Capone was sent to prison. In aviation, they were exciting times too, with Amelia Earhart and Amy Johnson hitting the headlines. So Richard, tell me about this special plane here. Well, this aircraft is the oldest aircraft on the airfield. She was made in 1932 in the Isle of Wight, and only about 17 or so of them were built. It's called the Spartan Arrow, made by the Spartan Aircraft Company, and this is the last surviving example of its type. So it's quite a special aircraft, and uh, it's been in my family for a long time. My father bought it 50 years ago this year. Um, he was at an air show, um, a photographer, um, as, as a hobby, and he saw this aircraft come in, got chatting with the pilot who said he was selling it, and he ended up buying this for just a few hundred pounds, although back then it was quite a lot of money. And uh, she's an absolute pleasure to fly, and she doesn't get out so often, unfortunately, because uh, it does take a lot to maintain an aircraft that's this old. How old is she exactly? She is 82 years old this year. And has she always been well behaved? Uh, mostly, yes. Yes, we do have uh, a few problems every now and again. As you can imagine, with such old technology, things do occasionally go wrong. The engine is 1930. She's just made out of wood and fabric mostly, that's all. Um, quite old wood at that, as you can imagine, um, such as the propeller, which we've just had to have uh, remade. And with that, we were able to reclaim some of the correct type of wood for the to match the original propeller. We found some 19th century mahogany <laughs> church pews and we were able to get a, a propeller company called Hercules Propeller to, uh, to, make those, uh, to make a new propeller for us. We'll be back with the Spartan Arrow later. The Kent, Surrey and Sussex Air Ambulance has its Surrey base at Redhill from where it now gives 24-hour coverage. We all hope we'll never need it, but in serious accidents and emergencies, it delivers an elite medical crew to where it's needed within 20 minutes flying time. Incredibly, it's a charity and relies on public support to fund its life-saving work. Here's Dr Richard Lyon to explain more about what our very own Helicopter Emergency Medical Service can do. So Richard, talk me through a bit about the equipment you've got here. Sure, so we're sitting here on um, Kent, Surrey and Sussex Air Ambulance and this is really a lifeline for patients that suffer acute injuries or become severely unwell in the community. Now thankfully that, that's not a large number but for some patients they just cannot wait to be taken to the hospital from the scene of an accident. We have to effectively bring the hospital to them. So everything we need to deliver really high-end care, so things like giving someone an anaesthetic or even performing surgical procedures is carried on this helicopter, mainly in these two rucksacks. But we also have um, blood on board. So this box has four units of blood inside it being kept cold in a special cool box for patients that might be bleeding to death and can't wait to get to hospital. They need the blood brought to them. The standard crew is a doctor and paramedic team working very closely together with two pilots up front and that crew is um, always the same. We fly 24 hours a day so a crew is on in the daytime and a second crew comes on to cover the night operations. Sometimes during the daylight hours we also have a third member of the team, particularly if we're training one of our new doctors or paramedics, and then we can take one patient on the stretcher. 
But what we actually aim to do is deliver the care to the patient as quickly as possible. So we're delivering that elite doctor paramedic team with all the equipment they need in the helicopter, which is really fast. And then actually how we take that patient to hospital may vary. Sometimes we put the patient on a helicopter and fly them, sometimes to a specialist trauma centre in London, for example. But actually sometimes it might be better if we put the patient on an ambulance and drive them to the nearest hospital. Tell me, Matt, how many jobs have you flown for the air ambulance? Uh, probably in the last 18 months since I've been here, a good couple of hundred. You can never tell um, what's going to happen on what day because it's very reactionary. So you could sit here all day and do nothing or you can be out literally from half past seven till half past six uh, on a 12-hour shift. And what sk special skills are necessary for the job? Um, well, we fly here with two crews because we're the only 24-7 uh, unit in the country. So uh, at night, the charity decided that from a safety point of view, the best option is to fly with two pilots. So we fly as a captain and a co-pilot, which I'm a co-pilot. Um, you know, so really your background, you need to have a good uh, grounding in the local area, flying in the local area, um, and just general ops and, you know, being used to being around helicopters and reactionary flying. It seems all quiet in the ops room, but that can change at any moment, as we found out as we started our interview with Richard. Hang on. Stopping only to pick up equipment, the crew does its checks and is out of the door. On this occasion, it uses a rapid response car as the helicopter was undergoing maintenance. But word soon came through that on this particular occasion, the casualty was okay. On his return to base, we grab Richard for take two. Richard, tell me about the map behind you. Um, so the map behind us really is the whole of Kent, Surrey, Sussex, which shows what a large area it is we actually cover. But one of the most striking things, I think, when you look at on the map is some of the distances involved. So particularly when you get, for example, into the far eastern regions of Kent, Surrey, Sussex, you know, way into Kent, you can be a long, long way from the major trauma centres, which are the specialist centres in London, like King's College Hospital or St George's Hospital, that you would need to be transported to to receive that expert high-end care if you're severely injured. So that is one of the reasons we use the helicopter, is to cover these large distances very quickly. And that becomes even more important at night time. Because at night time, we we can fly and land there's only few places we can actually take patients to at night by air so for example at the moment Southampton is the only hospital that has a nighttime helipad so if you were to be injured in the far eastern regions you can be a long way from the London hospitals and it's important we get there as quickly as possible when we fly at night it's obviously a very complex operation. Uh, we're the first air ambulance to be fully 24 seven. So we are available 24 hours a day and we undertake on average 1.7 missions per night, which is exactly what we predicted we would be undertaking. Now the missions at night tend to be more complex. The patients tend to be more severely ill or injured and the type of injuries are different. So at night we see much more in the way of assaults, um, particularly stabbings and shootings and people with severe brain injuries following assaults, which we don't tend to see so much of during the day. And obviously those patients you know, may need pretty rapid life-saving intervention. So we use a whole series of computer programming and simulation to work out where we may land, but if there's nowhere to land, for example, in some of the urban areas um, or in areas where there's overlying high-powered wires, we have a whole series of these red dots 
which are what we call pre-designated landing sites. So the helicopter itself was brand new specifically for night operations. So we've moved to a two-pilot model. The helicopter is fully equipped with instruments to fly at night, um, like very much like an airliner can. It has a traffic collision avoidance system so that we know what other aircraft are in the sky. It has an immensely powerful searchlight, which means we can really turn night into day in terms of floodlighting one of the scenes. And we all um, wear night vision goggles. Um, so these are incredibly high-tech pieces of kit uh, that attach onto our helmets um, and allow us to see um, essentially a green image of what is out there. And looking through these is really incredible. With the naked eye, we would just see complete black. But through, through the night vision goggles, it allows us to very clearly see um, roads, trees, houses, and, and identify obstacles. And we feel very strongly that the whole crew, so not only the pilots, but also the doctor and the paramedic, wear night vision goggles. We have four sets of eyes looking out for... Um, obstacles as we come into land. I personally work in an emergency department. I actually work up in Edinburgh in Scotland um, and, and jet back and forward to Gatwick which is um, quite exciting for me but yeah most of us either work in emergency departments or in anaesthetic departments um, in the full time in the NHS. My personal path I actually joined uh, the volunteer fire service when I was eight years old and it was a job at about four in the morning. Uh, I was out as a very junior fireman at the age of 15 <laughs> and we went to a car crash and, and I remember the, the scene really well. This young girl was critically injured and actually um, a car rocked up with flashing lights and these two men got out in jumpsuits and anaesthetized Natasha, the patient I was looking after in the back of the car. Uh, and for me, that was it. I thought that's just awesome because not only do you get to combine the excitement and the unpredictability of emergency pre-hospital care with the science of medicine and actually bringing, you know, scientific rationale and treatment to caring for these, you know, unfortunate patients. And so for me, it's just a dream come true to actually do the job that the only thing I've ever wanted to do since I was a little boy, essentially. <laughs> Red Hill Tower is Air Traffic Control HQ, and you may be surprised to learn that it can get busier than its rather noisy neighbour Gatwick, as Phil Wright explains. About how many takeoff and landings are you dealing with a day here? On a good day, at the weekends, we'll do about 300. Today, didn't start terribly well with the rain and the low clouds, so we're only up to about 50 today. So it's just relatively quiet. Air traffic is here to provide a safe and efficient service to the pilots, get aircraft in and out expeditiously, make best use of the airspace and the runways. Um, we normally get notified of a pilot calling us up on the radio to say they want to go flying. So in which case, we take the details that they give us over the radio, which will be the call sign, or the registration in this case, aircraft type, where it's going out to the east, how it's going to depart, and then the information that they give us from here, the weather. Each letter's got a, each weather's got a code that changes every 15 minutes. Got to do another one. Um, pressure, and then we give it a squawk that shows up on radar. So, so it's a four-letter code that shows up on the radar at Gatwick and at Heathrow, so they can see that the aircraft is working us. So it's not just a little blip that they don't know what it's doing. So if anyone goes where they shouldn't go, they know who to phone and say, oh, move it. Red Hill made an important contribution to World War II, initially as a training, testing and maintenance support, and then a fighter base for Spitfires. Passing by today gives little away of its evocative past, or indeed its contribution now. Over 300 people, many with specialist aviation skills, are employed in what remains an important helicopter base in the southeast for training, engineering, research and development. Alongside Red Hill's oldest hangar, seen here back in the aerodrome's war years, is a brand new cafe, quietly working its way into the centre of airfield life and offers a destination in itself 
for those who appreciate mouth-watering cake and other food with a side order of fabulous planes. Here's chef Wendy Baker. I like to see home, a lot of homemade. I like to make a lot of the food myself, like um, to have good quality food on the menu, good suppliers, a good source of um, you know, good quality food that we can either use as it is or to make it something into for the dishes on the menu. And what percentage of the menu is homemade? Um, at least 80% I would say and we're making here out of products that we buy from local suppliers. And that's a pretty high percentage. Yes, it, well, yes it is, but that's what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve something that is good, wholesome food um, that people will want to come and, and eat time after time. The, the cakes are particularly stupendous. Is, is that an area that you particularly enjoy? I love making the cakes, yes, yes. Uh, who doesn't get joy out of cake? <laughs> Front of house Jessica Blaine has been astonished by the hub's success. Amanda, it's going so well, beyond all our expectations. Um, we had no idea on you know, the 4th of May when we opened for the first time what was going to happen and around the corner flocked all these people and it has just increased week after week and um, yeah, we're getting lovely feedback from our customers that are passing on the word of mouth and the good feel factor of sitting on the decking at Red Hill Aerodrome in the sunshine. Yeah, definite house favourite is the courgette cake. Very unusual and many people are reluctant to try it but once they do um, it's, a, it's a hard and fast favourite. Yes. It's not often a trip to the loo is a real treat but follow me. <laughs> through the hangar reveals an array of aircraft which give several different options for people to enjoy their hobby. Richard explains that flying isn't only for multi-millionaires. Richard, tell me what we've got here. Well, just behind us here is a Microlite training aircraft. Now, when we talk about getting into flying and the accessibility, it's much, much easier than people think. This aircraft here, um, you only need 25 hours or so of flying in order to get your microlight license with this aircraft and the total cost of that is in the region of £4,000 all in. So it's far more accessible than, uh, than people really anticipate and then once you've got your license there are many easy ways to keep flying and enjoy flying beyond that. Well the main running costs for an aircraft are mainly to do with how much fuel it burns and these aircraft are incredibly reliable. They're around 90 or 100 horsepower um, with very uh, frugal engines and perhaps only use about 30 pounds of the fuel an hour that's all. So this is very different what have we got here? Well um, this is a 1946 uh, Stomp biplane designed in, Bil in uh, Belgium and uh, built in France just after the Second World War. The French Air Force built 700 of these just after the Second World War to rejuvenate their Air Force. So absolutely wonderful machine, uh, fully aerobatic and great fun to fly. And this again is a really good example of the sort of aircraft that you can get into once you've got your full pilot's license and it's far more affordable than people might otherwise think. Give me an example. Well, this aircraft, you could buy a share in this aircraft for about £4,500, so the price of a relatively modest second-hand car. Um, the running cost then, uh, in this particular group there are 10 people in it and it's about £100 a month as a fixed monthly charge for the running cost towards hangarage and uh, insurance. And then if you fly it, it's just over £100 an hour and that includes the fuel. So if you go for half an hour and take somebody else, it's about £25 or £30 each, which is pretty good value to go around in a fully aerobatic 1946 biplane. What do we have here, Richard? Well, this is another example of a different way to get into aviation. What we're looking at here is uh, a Vans RV7A, which is one of the most popular home-built aircraft. Um, many thousands of kits uh, across the Vans range have been built worldwide and this is the sort of aircraft that you build in your garage at home, uh, put it together and then eventually it makes it into an aircraft hangar and, uh, and, and flies. Most wonderful aircraft, it's, uh, it's very powerful, it's very fast, it's fully aerobatic and uh, really great fun to fly. This is two seats and it's got lots of um, great uh, gizmos and gadgets on the inside of it as well. This is a typical four-seat touring aircraft and once you've got your pilot's license, if you want to take your family flying or use the aircraft for business, this is a very effective way of doing it. Um, this particular aircraft is a French design. Again, it's not 
very expensive to buy into. There are many of aircraft of this particular type uh, which are in syndicate use, which means that you just have to buy a tenth or so of the aircraft and you get access to it. And uh, let's say you put four people on it, fly to Manchester. It will take you just over an hour to fly from London to Manchester in this aircraft. Costs in total in the region of around £150, so £37.50 each to get to Manchester in just over an hour. That's not bad. And that certainly adds up in business terms. Absolutely. When you look at the value of time of business travellers and people say now that time is the most precious commodity, um, then the ability of a small aircraft to save time is of, of uh, very significant value. Of course, if you do have a bigger chequebook, there's always the four-seater leather-clad luxury of this sporty number to whisk you away. This aircraft is a modern four-seat touring aircraft. It can carry four people, so a pilot and three passengers, and uh, travels, cruises at about 220 miles an hour. It has an oxygen system in it, so you can fly quite high and catch the wind. And uh, in terms of how far you can tra travel, uh, you can travel approximately from Surrey all the way down to the Mediterranean in one hop without refuelling and that will take about three and a half hours or so to get there. So it's a very useful aircraft and it has an additional very special feature which is a parachute. Um, there's a handle in the roof of the aircraft and if we pull that handle forward in flight a rocket fires out of the back of the aircraft and drags with it a huge parachute canopy and the entire aircraft and the occupants come down safely underneath the parachute. So if that's whetted your appetite for a spot of flying, how do you get started? I'm here with Charlotte and Mark from Cub Air, which is a pretty good place to start if someone wants to learn to fly. Charlotte, tell me the best way to start. Well, what we normally recommend is that people come and take one of our trial lessons uh, where we take them up, show them the controls and get them flying and see how they enjoy it and whether it's something they want to continue with. And Mark, what percentage of people, after they've had their trial, take it up? We'll probably say about 50% will, will carry on with it, yeah. And what's the cost involved? Um, if you have an initial trial lesson, a 30-minute lesson, will cost you about £98 in, in a katana. And then, depending on whether you want an hour lesson or you want to go to it in a larger aircraft, the price obviously will go up. And Charlotte, tell me a little bit more about this katana. Uh, this is what we do most of our basic uh, private pilot licence training in. Um, it's a good trainer, it teaches people to fly well, um, it's relatively cheap, um, so it's a good way to get started and uh, find out what sort of flying they want to do later on. And Mark, I always think that driving instructors have to have nerves of steel. Is it even worse if you're a flying instructor? No, I think it's probably easier because we have, do have dual controls to hand, so if we don't like what we see we can always take over at any moment, so it's probably... It, easier to cope with if you like than, than a driving instructor. And Charlotte, how many hours does it take to attain proficiency? Uh, you have to do a minimum of 45 hours for your private licence. Um, that involves all the, the training. To, to be proficient at, at the basic handling of the aircraft um, doesn't take quite so long. We do actually send people solo after something around 15 hours. Uh, so they're good enough to fly on their own after that amount of time. What would you say if someone's weighing up whether or not to give it a go, what would you say to them? Go and take a trial lesson and uh, see if you get hooked. <laughs> we weren't quite ready for flying solo, but Richard kindly offered to give us a bird's eye view above the familiar Surrey countryside. The flight that we're doing today is just uh, what's called a VFR flight, which is a visual flight, a flight by visual references. Uh, that there's a lot of the instrumentation that we won't actually be using on the flight today. Thank you. 
time to prepare the Dowager for her first flight since her nip and tucks. Will it all go according to plan, or has age finally caught up with the Spartan Arrow? A final refuel, and she's ready. Looking after the Spartan Arrow has been something of a labour of love for engineer Brian Tutty. Tell me what it's like working on what's pretty much a piece of aviation history. Well, we are very, very lucky to work on the Spartan. I mean, it is the very last one left in the world and um, everything on it, there's no drawings. We have to just literally um, very, very carefully lower the components down, photograph them and, and remachine them. And under the LAA, who is the Light Aircraft Association, we work very closely with them and uh, keep these wonderful machines in the air. Do you feel a special responsibility since she's the last one? Yes, I think there is. I think that the main thing about the Spartan is it is the last one and uh, we have to be very, very careful and mindful on how we actually sort of keep, keep an eye on it and keep it in the air. And the, the main thing um, is all the mechanical components, you know, they, they are there are no spares available and we have to literally rebuild everything. It's really exciting to actually uh, strip it all down, get all up, up, up to the hours up to date and then actually take a flying again and see it in the air. I mean, it is magical. And uh, everybody who sees it has really enjoys you know, seeing it in the air. It was a short but very successful flight for this unique aeroplane. She lives to fly another day, and who knows, for another generation. Richard, how did you feel? Oh, fantastic. Absolutely wonderful to be back up in the air. Really wonderful. You're coming back with a big old smile Huge, on your face. And that will last me all day, probably.